I'm standing in front of the building and this backpacker tourist from Spain comes up to me and says, do you know where the building ETZ room D961 is? I said, that's really funny. That's the lab that I'm working in. There's a bunch of computers. I said, I'll, I'll show you in. How come? What are, who are you looking for? He said, oh, just trying to get to the internet. So he pulls out Let's Go Europe book for Switzerland. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It said best <laughs> bandwidth in the, in the country is in this building. <laughs> you can go and write your emails. And uh, that, that cracked me up. In this episode, I'm talking with Ogi Stanovcic, who did his master in management, technology, and economics at ETH Zurich and has worked for the company Open Systems for over 20 years. This is the We Are ETH podcast, and I'm Susan Kish, your host. Why ETH? How did you pick ETH? You were a smart young thing wanting to study engineering. And how did you pick that particular school? It was a recommendation from a very respected professor who was uh, giving guidance and saying, this is one school that you should go to. That was ETH. And, uh, you know, the name, the history, the the Nobel laureates, <laughs> everything around it was part of that. And where were you living at the time when you made the decision to come to Zurich or and study at the ETH? I was living in uh, uh, former Yugoslavia, so in Belgrade, uh -huh. which is now in Serbia. Um, and by that time, it was kind of obvious there's not much for young people to, to do their so aspirations to, to go abroad just uh, strengthened. And this is how it came about to come to Switzerland. How did you make the decision to stay here? Because after you graduated, you started working here in, in IBM, right? That's right. I, uh, and, and I started that already through the studies. So to be honest, I was attracted to, to ETH, to ETH, mm -hmm. uh, but didn't really have Switzerland on the radar as such. So I was thinking, I'll just study at ETH <laughs> and then see. I'll do whatever. I'll do whatever, you know, where it goes. And I started loving Switzerland so much that it was a clear decision. This is the place where I'll stay. I love everything about it. What was the, the tweak? What are the two or three things you remember about Switzerland that caused you to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to stay? People. Okay. It's love. So Nina, today my wife, we started dating when I was uh, <laughs> at the university and that makes a huge, uh, a huge difference. That always makes a difference. That's a really good point. <laughs> and just the opportunities in, a, in an organized way, it's things work and you can thrive and you can develop things, you can, you can innovate. Uh, th those are the things that I, I loved about Switzerland that, and still do. What was it around questions of security? Because it, it looks like you, you studied or you started right off at the Global Security Analysis Lab in Rishikant, which must have been pretty intense, right? That's... Uh, that's an intense circus place. So what was it about technology and security or cybersecurity? Because those are early days. Why? What captured your interest? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Those were really early days. And this was the time when internet was coming, you know, out of academia into, uh, into businesses and talking about there's a need for security. And it's not just just doing some pranks. It's real stuff that's happening. And Global Security Analysis Lab had some of the most brilliant people, still has. Um, uh, there, I was, of course, junior, you know, I was uh, still at ETH. There were two things that sprung my passion during that time. Yeah. One is cybersecurity. And the other one was uh, video conferencing. And, and guess huh. what I'm doing today? I'm doing cybersecurity <laughs> over video conferences all day long. Oh, is that right? <laughs> Since, yes. I did my uh, master thesis on the video conferencing, on, on teleteaching and compression algorithms for teleteaching. So, so that was really very, very interesting. And the other part was security. And at that time, it didn't look like these two things really kind of 
combine well, but both were right. um, a, a passion. Because that's it's, that's uh, before voice over IP. That's before all that stuff, right? This was the early days of voice over IP. So let's say mid nineties, it started, and yeah. there was some university researches that had the first, you know, audio and video codecs that could be squeezed through the bandwidths that were available at the time. Which all came through into town through Technopark, right? Yes. That's my recollection, was that the big pipes came in through Technopark, and the only place you can get online was like if you knew somebody at the ETH, because otherwise, forget oh. it. And it, it, I'll, I'll tell you a really funny story that, that, that <laughs> happened sometimes in the mid-90s when I was at the ETH at the Electrical Engineering Building. I was doing my, my semester work, and this was also using video conferencing. And I had a friend who studied with me. He's from Chicago. So when he went to Chicago, he went to a lab there. And we were testing the oh. delays and latencies and bandwidths um, and stuff. So I go out to take a break. I'm standing in front of the building, and uh, this backpacker tourist uh, from Spain comes up to me and says, do you know where the building ETZ, so ETZ, room D961 is? I said, that's really funny. That's the lab that I'm working in. There's a bunch of computers. Uh, I said, I'll, I'll show you in. How come? What are, who are you looking for? You know. He said, oh, just trying to get to the internet. So he pulls out Let's Go Europe book for Switzerland. <laughs> Oh my gosh. It said best <laughs> bandwidth in, <laughs> in the country is in this building. <laughs> and you can go and write your emails. And uh, that, that cracked me up. So, so at that time, it was, it was bandwidth um, that was limiting the video conferencing. That was the challenge for teleteaching. So analyzing that from the technology point of view, but also from the user experience. It was fantastic. It was like a playground you just could not find. Unless wow. you had the Let's Go Europe book, you would not know where to, <laughs> where to experience with that. So what caused you to make the leap from an IBM to a startup? Because you joined Open Systems in what, 99? In 99, yes. That's like at the peak of that first internet wave. That's when, why, yes. when the magazines used to be this thick. Right, with all the Absolutely. advertisements and stories. And, and, and the advertising was still in the print, like you say, and then internet. Yeah, totally. So Open Systems was a very small, very specialized company that I got to know, not just in Switzerland, but, but even in Europe, that were doing some, some real real life projects going and protecting uh, organizations you know firewalls and intrusion detection and all that and and yeah. and that was it i was like this is the company it i want to cool go it was a cool time in. i did it was very cool time i um loved it i never really made any plans I, I certainly didn't think I would stay for, you know, a quarter of a century in, in the same company at the time, but it was just great. And it still is. It's just there's so much happening in this space. And when you have excellent people around you and when you have excellent customers working with you and when you feel that you're doing something really good, you just stay. It's just amazing every time. That is very inspiring. And I have to say that's exceptional, right? Finding people who've stayed at the same company and still smile as you are right now and talk about it with <laughs> such joy, is that's just very, very cool. So um, as we were speaking about before, I'm pretty sure I met you 20 plus years ago in Zurich when I did something called First <laughs> Tuesday Zurich, which met on the first Tuesday of the month. Do you remember those times? And do you remember do you remember any stories from those times? Oh, I remember that and I remember meeting you like it was like it was yesterday, Susan. This was first Tuesday. Very well known, actually. Everybody in our industry was trying to get on to that and let's get Susan and be nice to Susan so that she can invite you. So this was really a, a very attractive platform. I went there by I wouldn't call it an accident, or maybe it's an accident or serendipity. <laughs> My friend Florian, uh, Florian Gutzfiller, who is the founder of Open Systems, was invited to speak. He had a snowboard accident just before. He calls me in the morning on that Tuesday and says, I have to go to the hospital. I just can't come. I just can't come. 
can you go stand in there? <laughs> and when I came in and that whole, so this was at the stock exchange, full audience. <laughs> we used to get a thousand people for those. When I peeked behind that curtain, I think my blood drained out of <laughs> every <laughs> cell of my body. Uh, but you were kind and we spoke about it. And th this was interesting time. Investors were interested. We were not really looking for investors and and for the longest time the very swiss way let's earn the money and and do it until you have the maturity to say okay let's expand this globally and uh internationally and those were wonderful times and i remember open systems because you were what we used to at that time call a hot startup and it was one of the few places first tuesday was one of the few places you can go and meet investors and potential clients and sort of the whole range because it was before you had before LinkedIn, before Zing, before AngelList, before any of those. Yes. They didn't, the concept of an incubator was not well formed. Anyway, those were interesting times. Oh, those were, I still think today of these, how, you know, the, there was a quick briefing of how to do a three minute pitch, <laughs> you know, the elevator pitch <laughs> and doing that. Very cool times. So you are still, as we just said, still with Open Systems. Yeah. And in fact, it sounds like your job recently changed. So what do you do at Open Systems now? So I take care of strategic alliances. and um, Okay, which means what? Which means, well, the biggest in this space, Microsoft has become very strong, hasn't always been uh, in the security space strong, but with uh, huge investments, uh -huh. focus and, and adoption of the cloud, that became a very, very uh, big and important alliance for us from the technology point of view as well as go to market so so that's the biggest part of that and also keeping all these relationships together looking into how the, the ecosystem and technologies and so on serves together to protect our clients around the world that's the result of that so when you see a strategic alliance with microsoft as your big guy does that mean figuring out how to integrate open systems seamlessly into the microsoft platform so or what does that practically mean? How do we connect our product team with Microsoft product teams so mm -hmm. that you don't wake up in the morning and the world has changed, but you, you have a certain heads up to adopt. So, so when something is announced and the amount of news that come in this space is incredible. There are books with just summaries of what was announced at the last event um, doing that. <laughs> so doing all that, the entire organization does that. You know, when you partner with somebody who has more than 100,000 people, there's a lot of work to just keep track of who is doing what and where and how, how you do that. One of the things, as you said, cybersecurity is like in the news all the time. And the other huge thing in the news these days is around GBT, now GBT4. Yeah. Right. And yes. how it's making a difference. I just used it to write a poem in iambic pentameter about, you know, the risks of AI. What are your thoughts about ChatGBT4 and its impact in what you do and what Open Systems does around security? Absolutely uh, exciting times. There was somebody who once said, if it's written in Python, it's machine learning. If it's written on PowerPoint, it's AI. Well, that's interesting. That was kind of the joke for the longest time. And now the world has seen, no, actually, there's there's a lot more uh, to that. This isn't ju just come overnight, but in our space, very, very important. So no, we are not there yet that AI or GPT can do everything for us and we can just go back and relax. There's still a lot of work to do for humans in there. Mm -hmm. But there's examples of writing pieces of code and query where you can use ChatGPT and say, okay, I would like to refine this query and, and, and do that. Everything in security is about queries. Data is around. It's really, are you looking for the right thing? So querying these security logs to come to the right decision fast. Everything is about speed. This is where uh, that comes in. So that sounds like using ChatGPT to strengthen, speed up, deepen the protections. Yes. But it can also be used on the bad actor side, right? Yes. It could be used to improve your phishing, take out those giveaway spelling mistakes that you get in those emails that you go, wait, that doesn't sound right. Yes, 100%. I mean, if you look how these phishing emails are written, 
today compared to you know some years ago you can already see that just just like you say that's an excellent example of of what it is there's there's more things again chat gpt is not just about doing spelling or write me a you know biography in in a nice way it can write code there's that nothing is good or bad but the thinking makes it so i think i think there's the the, the use makes it so just like anything in our industry every advancement can be used for good or bad so it's really a question of how do you get on the good side of things very cool so it sounds like watch this space oh yeah very much it's still in the early days it's dramatically changing capabilities uh, and use and i think also challenging academia in terms of is this paper written by a human or th- yeah yeah and yeah. paper writing and how you form your questions and queries for basic research and applied research i i think it will be dramatic i think that's exactly right so going back to open systems you mentioned florian the original founder, and also Martin Boshart, who mm-hmm. we had a wonderful conversation with earlier in ATH Circle. Are you still in touch with those folks? Very much so. Very much so. We are friends, godfathers to children, uh, uh, and, and, <laughs> oh, and so right. on. That's great. Um, I'm really proud of that. Obviously, we're all, always very busy, and you would like to see each other more, but, but we are very much in touch. And um, when we were Doing business together, many people said, is that even possible to be friends and do business? Uh, and I didn't know the answer at the time, but I said, well, what choice do I have? I like, I like these people and, and I like working with them. And, and we always had lots of fun. And I can now clearly say, yes, it's possible. You can be friends and you can do business. And it's a lot of fun to do it like that. So, And that's probably part of the reason you're still... At open systems. It's certainly a part of the reason, and, and it was certainly a part of the reason why I was really looking forward, to, I, I still am, looking forward to go to work every day. It's fun. Do you work from home or do you go to the office? Both. Mm-hmm. I do about 50-50 these days, but I love going to the office. I love seeing people. Uh, when you're in the office and you go to grab a coffee, there's that serendipity, and I love That's it. Right. When, that word. You know, That's right. You meet somebody who just came from Eteha, and they're telling you what she or he did as their masters and just started here and what motivated them to come. That's the fuel for really being still excited after all these years. So That's very cool. Now, apparently, I remember your office as being very light, very bright, very airy, but also... I understand you've got some pieces of art from H.R. Geiger, the Swiss guy, the Swiss artist who did the alien work. The, Is that, did some interior designer select that or was there some more thought behind that? Oh, there was a lot more thought behind that. And uh, <laughs> yes, thank you for saying that. And anybody who wants to come and visit is, is welcome, even though we're a security company, we stay open and look to be very transparent and open so so we like to welcome uh, visitors the geiger looks like a monster it looks very much like <laughs> that alien that, that won the oscar hr giger did that for open systems this was his visualization of a computer virus oh no kidding in a ratio of something like 333 million to to one so at that time the, the slogan we used was immune system for your networks. And what Open Systems and Ontinio now did was always that, fight out the bad things and keep the body healthy, keep the organization healthy. So that was the story. And this was what H.R. Giger then took out and said, okay, I'm going to v- visualize a virus that's hanging out here um, and doing that. So that was- That's great. There. So you guys that's commissioned that. Piece. Yes. Very, very cool. So outside of work, it sounds like you spend a lot of time with the Aladdin Foundation, which looks like a wonderful organization working with children who are desperately ill. Can you tell us a bit about how did you start working with them and and tell us a bit about the foundation? Very gladly. I'm really passionate about that. So, so I'm there since the founding of the foundation, one of the founding members, I believe in 1996. 
being involved in, and with a number of people involved in other charities and so on, um, we understood there's a need actually for the entire family. So, so when a child is sick, uh, has uh, a challenge, disability, being hospitalized for a very long time, it is obviously the child itself, but actually the entire family who is in absolute distress over a very yeah. long period of time. It's siblings who suffer because parents mm -hmm. will have to focus on the child who has to have a dialysis every day um, and so on. And they don't have time for, for, yeah. for, for, the, for the other children. There's actually a word in German, Schattengeschwister, Schattenkinder. So they stay in the shadow huh. and uh, the Aladdin Foundation is relief for the entire family. So that could be organizing holidays, organizing a place where you can go with wheelchair, you can, uh, you can have that. There's other families uh, there and there's people volunteering and, and uh, taking care of and cooking and doing program and, and making it interesting. For some of these families, this was the very first holiday. When, when, when they came there, they said, this is the very first holiday we had since we had the child with uh, illness or, or disability. There's other things like having volunteers, amazing people who volunteer and come in the rotation to be in the children's hospital, to spend time with the children when there are gaps so these children are not alone. Uh, it sounds like it really does. It's, it's very focused and it really makes a difference. It does. And what really makes a difference is when you meet a child like that or a family uh, like that, they tell you how they experience that or, or, or from their perspective. Sometimes you just say, wow, you know, it's worth it. Yep. Very, very cool. So I'm going to ask you a few questions about the ETH. How did the years at ETH influence your choices? Yes. Years at ETH not only influenced my choices and what I do today, but literally everything about my life today is influenced by ETH. And I'm thankful for that. This is what I said is certainly part of the reason why um, I love the idea of ETH Circle and, and doing something and, and bringing back. So the professional choices, certainly, like I said, uh, cybersecurity, I got into that when I was at, uh, at the ETH. It wasn't a specific, you couldn't have at that time a lecture on the topic, right. but understanding everything about computer networking and how things uh, work together gave that basic to, to, to even understand you know the field and get into that friends i have so many friends those are all from student days not everybody was at, at uh, eteha some of them were from university or somewhere else uh, uh that that you know but but it's it's really everything my my circle of friends my my life is very tied to to eth very cool so i'm going to three closing questions in zurich what is your favorite place to go? Well, wow, that's a difficult one. I love a, a <laughs> lot of places in Zurich, but I would say if you ask others, where does Augie still like to go these days for lunch, not for parties or for first Tuesday events, <laughs> that'll be Kaufleuten. <laughs> so, so, so that's... Uh, okay, if, you know, they make the best steak tartare, at least they used to. Absolutely, they still do. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. And when you were young, when you were just growing up, what did you want to be when you grew up? I don't know. There, there's all these boy fantasies about, you know, pilot and you know, astronauts, whatever. Astronauts, but, yep. <laughs> yeah. At about the age of 12, my brother and I, I have an, uh, an older brother. He is a year and a half older. We put our money together and bought the first computer. This was a oh, wow. Sinclair Spectrum. <laughs> To be honest, this was about gaming first, but it was a really cleverly designed computer that had all of the, had some, some most important uh, uh, programming commands on its keyboard. So you could kind of see, you could learn basic at the time. Um, so from playing games, it started on by getting to some nerdy magazines that said, okay, if you change this code here, um, you can get, you know, 
unlimited lives in the game or, or whatever <laughs> then it, it was. Sure. And then you start digging for that in the code. So, so around that time, I started being fascinated with computers and that led to the rest of it. I, I thought actually I would be a programmer one day, computer programmer one day. Very, very cool. And what are you... What are you learning about today? What are the books in your bookshelf? What are you, what's captured your curiosity? I like variation of books. I sometimes like to read very different books, biographies. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a variation. One of the most recent, really fascinating books uh, that, that I recently finished is called Chip War. Oh, I have it just on my bookshelf. You have it on your bookshelf. Okay, I didn't yeah. see it. It's <laughs> amazing. It tell it's it's that combination of technology and advancement, but also how technology and geopolitics and economics uh, uh, play a role together. It's it's incredible. Yeah, it really ref I found it reframed my view about the world. Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, Ogi, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being open about this. That was a great conversation. Thank you very much, Susan. Really, really appreciate being here. Thanks. I'm Susan Kish, host of the We Are ETH series, telling the story of the alumni and friends of the ETH Zurich, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. ETH regularly ranks amongst the top universities in the world with cutting edge research, science, and people. The people who were there, the people who are there, and the people who will be there. Please subscribe to this podcast and join us wherever you listen. And give us a good rating on Spotify or Apple if you enjoyed today's conversation. I'd like to thank our producers at ETH Circle and LA Media. And thank you, our listeners, for joining us 